uh, then there is a new drama that intervenes. And, and this paper uh, doesn't have a chance to get into that. But there is a new drama. And the new drama is, what is the relationship between vision and language? So he starts with the assumption that this is, it's a, his is a visionary text. In fact, he goes on criticizing everybody. I saw it. I was there. How can you, it's hard to argue with that, you know, with the, the, the sense of the private, uh, uh, this visionary experience. And yet the problem is, uh, is this a strategy in order to legitimize and authorize certain language? Which is very strange, because as you know, in um, the relationship between, for instance, uh, prophecy, speech, language, and, and, uh, uh, and mystical vision, it's not a necessary relationship. You have many prophets who never claim that they saw anything. You have, you know, you have Ezekiel who saw, but uh, it's a strange idea that Dante should, does he feel that he has to say that he saw so that he can be authorized to go on saying certain things? That's probably one of the ways. But that's not what makes the relationship between vision and language a complex relationship. The fact is uh, that uh, uh, if by the end of Paradise, for instance, there is this outrage and he gets out of himself, uh, uh, is this, how are you going to represent that? And he never does, nor does he try. The poem starts as a kind of displacement out of that vision. So there is a kind of dark hole at the end uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the poem. And the point would be, and there's a way of coming back to, to your question, or the, the argument that I would make, is that he truly uses language in order to engender a vision. So that the point would be the way out of this visionary is still the, the <coughs> descent into the temporality of language, the contingency of language, uh, and also the, the impulse that language may make us see, may truly create that which he himself may have seen, which we never really know. We only can have, through what his own words, uh, have the power of conjuring up. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. But uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the if there is a union mystica, right, this mystical union, there's not a trace of that in Paradise 33. Uh, there is, on the contrary, the desire, there is not a, uh, there is, a, there is not even a kind of erotic language of, of, of joining into the losing one's own individuality. On the contrary, there's a desire, uh, and there is a, a fact of preserving one's own autonomy. There's such a rationality at the end of Paradise, uh, which is, uh, to me, a very powerful argument in, um, in, in uh, countering the idea that Dante may have had a mystical vision. What I do think that he's doing is that he's trying to see the, com the, the I would say, complicity, almost, between the way poetic language and the way uh, the mystical experience work, that both of them seem to be made of absences and presences. Both of them seem to be uh, obliquely uh, related to some kind of visionary moment. Both of them are displacements in terms of a certain plenitude. That, yes. Uh, but all the other implications of the mystical vision certainly are not there, I don't think. I don't think. Oh, if, uh, let's see if there is something. Thank you again, Professor Matsotto, for your very dynamic, not static presentation. <laughs> and thank you all for coming, too. I believe there are a few little refreshments out there. You have just a minute to grab.